So over the next few days, my plan is going to be to bring Mike closer to me and sever his relationship with Hi. And Hi has given me enough ammunition to do that. Yeah. Can I tell you what his plan is according to him to me? Yeah. Hi came to me and said, Mike will do anything I say in this game. He is my puppet <gasps> at, at this game. And so Whoa. that's why I was ever- I'm done. Right. He's a liar. Hi has never told me that Mike was a puppet, but hearing those words just supercharged Mike. And I'm like, Mike, I would never treat you that way. <laughs> Hi thinks I'm totally with him. I'm his puppet. I'll do whatever he wants. This is totally gameplay, but he played me, so this is personal for me now too. <sighs> well, um, Survivor 42's most ingenious moves it is. Hello everybody, my name is Bandit. What are your names? Okay, don't jump to all answer at once. Today I'm going to be reviewing the ingenious moves used in the season that just ended, Survivor 42. This video will cover several ingenious moves, a bit more quickfire than my Australian Survivor Most Ingenious Moves series, but nonetheless, let's dive into the video. At number one, we have Hai at the final 16 tribal, managing to capitalize on a cracked majority, ensuring he wins the tribal council dilemma, despite being in the minority. At this tribal, it was 4-2 and should have been an easy elimination of Lydia, Hai's closest ally. But Mike found a beware advantage, lost his vote, and the rest of the story is as ancient as he is. So the majority still had three votes, but Chanel was sent away to Shipwheel Island, where she risked and lost her vote as part of the dilemma. When she returns to camp, Hai instantly can tell something is up, and I think he doesn't get enough credit for labelling Chanel as suspicious, and not going through with her last minute plans to split the vote on Mike and Jenny. Had he done this, then he would have lost the vote 2-1-1, and wouldn't have appeared in this video. But High sticks with his original vote, causing a 2 2 tie and then a 1 1 tie at the revote. As the rules of Survivor states, we have two ties, and if High and Daniel can't both agree on who needs to go between Jenny and Lydia, then both ladies become immune and the other four draw rocks. Here's how the situation initially plays out. I, I want to get the ball rolling by starting with the following premise. I really do not want to draw rocks. Let's hammer it out and get to a consensus so that on the very first boat in day seven, we don't put our fate in a bag of rocks. Did you catch that? The rocks discussion starts and within seconds, High has won the situation because Daniel has clearly stated how afraid he is of rocks. Hai even identifies this, and so, down the line, when asked if he would change his vote, he just straight up refuses. I understand the confusion That's right true. now. I love y'all. I'm willing to draw rocks. I'm not changing my vote from Jenny. This forces a Daniel, terrified of rocks, to have the decision of, you know, going to rocks. Ultimately, Daniel obviously votes out Jenny, going along with Hai and saving his closest ally in Lydia. I also like how Hai appears at this tribal, with a calm demeanour that appears to be very understanding, despite likely not actually feeling that way. Juxtapose this with Daniel throwing Shan under the bus and acting extremely chaotic. Now tell me which individual side looks more appealing to join if you're Mike. In spite of being at the bottom with Lydia, Hai and her control the next vote and make it to merge. All in all, an incredible array of skills showcased by Hai. Weaving in at two, see what I just did there, we have Jonathan's challenge assist in the reward challenge. This comes in the insane lead he gives his Taku tribe, resulting in them obtaining one of the biggest challenge blowouts in Survivor history, and his tribe honestly wins one of the better rewards with 10 massive fish. In this challenge, Jonathan just takes control and tells the tribe from his perspective where both Lindsay and Omar should be moving. I know a lot of people refer to Jonathan's challenge capabilities as him just being muscular or big, but in this challenge, those factors aren't much use. 
Rather, Jonathan showcases fantastic leadership with clear and concise commands to his tribe mates. And I can't understate how far ahead Taku get with Jonathan's help. They get through the next portions, including the basketball endgame, without either of the tribes even finishing the braid. Now that's just great strategy. We also need to discuss Tori, Romeo, and Drea coming together and putting their differences aside to eliminate a massive under the radar threat playing both sides in Swati. We've seen from seasons past, even with Tony and Winners at War, that the individual playing both sides can just pit the two sides against one another and end up at the end. But in this instance, Drea collaborates with Romeo that something seems a bit fishy. No, not Taku's reward, but she finds out Swati has been saying to everyone that they're all her closest allies. Again, quite a few people, when told by a person they're their number one, would like to keep that information to themselves. It's Survivor, telling people your alliances only harms your position. So, while Swati's strategy plays on the meta of people keeping information to themselves, and therefore this helps her positioning, it comes apart when Drea thinks outside of the box. With Drea and Romeo working out, they're being told the same thing, they reach out to Tori who is on the bottom, and, albeit reluctantly, says yep, Swati's been saying the exact same thing to her. This causes the elimination of Swati eventually, who was a massive strategic threat and had genuine winner equity due to her strong gameplay. But shout out to Drea and Romeo. On the topic of Drea, I wasn't sure if this was worthy of being an ingenious move per se, so at 3.5, I have to congratulate her for finding four advantages, the most anyone has found. I have my amulet. I have my idol. I have my extra vote, and I have my knowledge is power advantage. This is made even more impressive, considering many of her advantages required her outplaying beware disadvantages. To get an idol, she had to say a phrase, to get her amulet coin, she had to rub dirt on herself, and to get her safety without power, she had to work hard to wash red paint off her arm. This advantage was also clutch, considering she got it from the same bench that Xander failed to find his advantage under. So it wasn't an easy find. Drea showcased an ability to sniff out advantages like none other on this season, with her even keeping all her advantages up until the final 10 double tribal. Unless production ups the amount of advantages, this record of 4 set by Drea will be hard to beat. At 4 we have Marianne, with probably the best attempt at hiding her idol with the secret phrases. Starting in Survivor 41, the regular idol was replaced by the Beware Advantage, which held the players vote at ransom until all three idols were found, but they also required the players to say a secret phrase. Marianne's by far, in my opinion, was the most difficult. Like Drea's potato one was goofy, but at least she could relate it to the lack of food. Mike's was about soccer. Okay, tougher, but he could still relate it to an immunity challenge. But what on earth is the bunny rabbit doing in the meal box? Your phrase. It's another classic case of the bunny rabbit having dinner in the mailbox. What does that even mean? In 41, we saw players struggle with integrating their phrases into conversation. Broccoli is, uh, grows little bunches on uh, small trees, so I feel like a little broccoli tree, I guess. Yep, that's made. Nobody suspicious, Brad. In spite of receiving this difficult phrase, however, Marianne aces saying the phrase on three occasions. This is helped by her hyper, I'm just going to say everything in my mind mentality, but you do have to give her credit. Her saying these phrases only for the other players to assume that's just usual quirky Marianne is very smart. Future players can learn a lot from this social skill. I want to quickly move into the merge before backtracking, but at 5 I have Omar and him completely controlling the merge, without even having a vote. Because he risked his vote alongside Chanel, this results in him having no vote. This doesn't stop Omar however, as he manages to save his shield and Jonathan by forming a strong bond with everyone at merge and telling them they need to get out Lydia. Just to showcase how good Omar's social skills are, he managed to get Hyde to vote out Lydia. 
his number one ally throughout the entire game. Now that's impressive. Now at this part of the game, there was a core 9 majority. They all knew Omar controlled the vote, however those left on the outs like Marianne, Romeo, Chanel and Tori assumed Omar was on the outs. This aided his strong swing position at the next round and continued the momentum of him being on top by booting Chanel. On the topic of Chanel, we also have to discuss her putting a vote on Mike at the Daniel boot. Now this move didn't work out, but we see Devins at the final 5 in HHH putting his vote on Mike and it saves him despite Ben having an idol. In the same vein, Chanel puts her vote onto Mike despite Daniel who is the clear boot of the tribal. This does the outplay a shot in the dark play by Daniel, an advantage newly introduced into the season, giving a player a 1 in 6 shot at gaining immunity, but they have to sacrifice their vote. If Daniel was immune and blocked every vote at Tribal, a revote occurs where Chanel would have undoubtedly been the second best option. So within a vacuum, Chanel putting her vote onto Mike is the optimal move. The issue is, it doesn't consider the majority's optimal move, consisting of High, Lydia and Mike, where they also have to assume Daniel successfully plays his shot in the dark, and Chanel puts a vote on one of them. Therefore, they split the vote with Lydia and High, putting votes on Daniel, and Mike puts his vote on Chanel. In spite of Chanel being outplayed, with her still being booted, had Daniel played a successful shot in the dark, Mixed with Mike hypocritically getting upset at her for not putting her vote on Daniel because, you know, who else could possibly do that? But she would have been on the bottom anyway and shows a strategy that can be expanded upon to avoid an individual getting shot in the dark. Back at the merge, we also had the Rice Dilemma return where the contestants bargained with probes until only four people had to sit out. So we only had three sitters, Andrea, Lindsay and Marianne, but nobody was willing to take the fourth spot. This was a massive deal to the tribe, as if they couldn't pick a fourth person, then they wouldn't get the bag of rice. And in a season as bare bones as Survivor 42, this food was worth its weight in gold. So Marianne uses her position on the bottom to interestingly aid her in flipping the fourth and final person. She plays on the emotions, even pulling out the waterworks and stating how she could be voted out because of this decision not to play. However, two things. Firstly, this creates this reverse psychology where despite saying she's on the bottom and knows she probably will be going this round, she instills fear in the majority. After all, if a person is on the bottom, knows they're going to get voted out, but has an idol, wouldn't you try to burn it rather than actually vote Marianne this tribal and risk burning the votes cast against her? Secondly, we see Marianne use emotional manipulation to get Omar to eventually sit out, securing the tribe rice, and this creates a meta style of strategy. In the olden days of Survivor, emotional gameplay was the norm, so when people were using strategic gameplay like Hatch, Vesepia, Brian, Rob, or Fairplay, they were getting further in the game because their ideology was pricking up the ears of others because it wasn't the same old emotional spiel. However, Survivor has evolved and because of it, utilising emotional gameplay is extremely rare, whereas trying to use strategy to get someone on side is the norm. But Marianne uses a genuinely great niche, approaching the tribe from the angle of emotions. She didn't rattle off game theory or state to the tribe how strategically one of them sitting was better. She used emotions, which in the modern era where emotions are rarely used, makes much more of an impact. To know that I'm giving a chance for you guys to move forward, like please, just like in your heart, just do it, please. Like I'm begging you. I'll do it. All right. Sit out. Omar. Omar. That's four. Therefore, it should be no surprise Omar quickly decided to give up a shot at immunity to play into Marianne's hands. At seven, I mean he was on the thumbnail, we have Omar straight up lying to Mike to get rid of an ally. At this stage in the game, Omar was close to Mike, but Mike was also aligned with Hai, which was an issue because Omar wanted Mike to himself. So what's better than straight up lying to Mike that Hai was saying degrading things about him and their relationship? He's a liar. Hai has never told me that Mike was a puppet, but hearing those words just supercharged Mike, 
And I'm like, Mike, I would never treat you that way. <laughs> you know I know you're telling the truth? Because what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and I believe it. Understandably, this infuriates Mike, further perpetuated by the fact he's someone that prioritizes mateship ideology in the game. Now we've seen this strategy used by Boss and Rob in Winners at War, and may have inspired Omar, where, despite being on the bottom, he manages to convince Jeremy and Michelle that Adam is scheming with him. Therefore, at least portrayed in the edit, if their tribe ever went to tribal, Rob's lie should have eliminated Adam, but obviously they win the challenge and this never comes into fruition. Omar takes it a step further, abusing his incredible position at the final 8 and eliminates High, allowing him somehow even better agency at the final 7. All because of one good lie. We will continue on the Omar train with the next stop being the previously teased final 7. In this round, Omar had everyone in his pocket, including Drea who had a knowledge is power advantage in her pocket. Ironic eh? Last season we learned if you have this power, you absolutely do not tell anyone, but of course the Survivor 42 cast couldn't watch last season, and so Drea didn't know about Liana previously having the knowledge as power advantage and wasting it. Much like Liana, she tells a close ally in Omar about the power to steal an idol, but as we've already discussed, Omar is very strategic and knows if he lets Drea use this power, she can steal Mike's idol which gives her immunity, plus it's a fantastic move for the jury to witness. So Omar takes this information and tells Mike about Drea's advantage. Omar then formulates a plan for Mike to give him the idol, so Dre has no form of immunity while also strengthening his bond with Mike. Unlike Xander last season, who was greatly helped in the planning process with Evie and Tiffany, this is all Omar. Successfully he outplays Dre's advantage and votes her out at the same tribal. As a cherry on top, Mike feels so indebted to him that even when Marianne is trying to flip the numbers on Omar the next round, he sticks with his original vote. Next up, I mean we have to discuss it, it's the insane 3 2, 2 move where Marianne makes a fantastic move that skyrockets her resume and for the first time an extra vote has actually been pivotal in changing the vote. At this round Omar was a massive threat but it seemed like nobody but Marianne was willing to take the shot at him. Lindsay continued to be hellbent on getting out Jonathan, Jonathan and Mike continued to want Romeo out, and this only really left Marianne and Romeo. Now while Marianne does talk about the vote being 5 to 2, particularly to Romeo, we see her later identifying the vote will likely come down to it being 3 to 2 with Mike. So all Marianne needed was an additional vote on top of her own two. Enter Romeo, perpetual underdog and vote magnet who realistically should have been voting for Jonathan considering the two really didn't get along and Jonathan was writing down his name at tribal. Instead, Marianne instructs Romeo to vote for Omar which wouldn't have happened had Marianne not formed such a strong bond with Romeo. So that means that us four are five votes. This is what we need to do. Me, you, Jonathan, Mike, but Omar because Omar will win. Okay, Omar will win. And if you don't believe me when I say they had a good relationship, Romeo literally saves her from fire making at the final four, despite acknowledging her and Mike as the toughest beats at the end. So, skip to tribal where Marianne blindsides Omar, almost arrests the tribe and the jury. What's even more impressive is after Marianne's move, she's not even targeted at the final 5 round and has Mike play an idol on her for good measure. Rounding out the list, we have Romeo's fake idol at 5, which, honestly, in terms of presentation and story, is one of the best fakes. We've seen people trying to fake idols in these rounds, it is true, but are less successful in their approaches. Firstly, I love how Romeo drops this piece of information after a massive argument between Lindsay and Jonathan. He's essentially lying to them when they are drained after the stress and confusion from tribal and visiting a new island. Like we see when he states he has an idol, nobody questions it, and Mike essentially congratulates him for holding on to it for so long. So I thought the only way that I can survive the next tribal council is to come up with this lie, which is to say that I have a hidden immunity idol. Romeo? Yeah. You got holes of steel not using it yet. 
they seem to buy it. With the knowledge of Mike's idol, as well as Marianne's idol in the game at the final five, it makes Romeo a far less appealing option to split votes onto. After all, what's the point of putting votes on someone just to have them negated with an idol they've told you they're playing on themselves? So through one lie, Romeo more or less gives himself an individual immunity necklace and ensures he doesn't receive rogue votes at a tribal where, considering the idol still in the game, one or two stray votes could send you home. But that's the video. Did I miss any ingenious moves? Let me know down